everybody. I am Andrew Greer with CCM Magazine, and this, of course, is Miss Sandy Patty. We're so good to have you here with it's, us today. <laughs> it's, it's awesome. It's surreal. It's, you know, so many years have gone by from CCM being, you know, the person taking shorthand <laughs> to now it's, you know, video and it's a oh, yeah. visual experience. Yeah, entirely new world. Uh, we are so excited to have you here and to get to feature this on a cover, of course. We were looking back at some of the older covers and finding those. I'm sure you would be interested in the hair. And the, the hair. <laughs> the hair. And you those know, things. I've always said it's never been a haircut. It's a statement. <laughs> So kind of whatever's going on in my life, you can look at the hair and go, oh, okay, I see. <laughs> well, you know, the thing that we think about, I think that's resonating in everyone's mind and probably a question that you get all over the country right now. I think not only from a fan perspective or a listener perspective, friend perspective, even people inside the industry have come to admire you for, of course, for your musical capability, your giftings as a performer and a communicator. But I think people are really balancing the question of why retire or what is gospel music going to be like without Sandy because mm -hmm. we've fallen in love with who you are. And so, you know, the question that's on everyone's mind, why retire and why now? Well, I, I do get that question a lot. And I've thought about it. I'm a, I'm a <laughs> very introverted person, you know, believe it or not. So I've really thought it through. Um, so a couple reasons. One, Don and I have raised eight kids and they're all grown. And so that basically makes us empty nesters. And we have one grandson and we have two grandkids on the way. So that's a new season for oh. us. Um, a good season? A very good season. <laughs> you know, I know I know. some people think that they want to hear me say, oh, it's so hard being an empty nester. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then another reason is, uh, according to the Metropolitan Opera, a woman's vocal prime is between the ages of 45 and 60 years old. And I'm definitely closer to one end than the other. <laughs> And I love music so much that I want to be mindful of the art form. You know, the interesting thing, Andrew, I feel like 30 years ago, there were a lot of people listening to what I had to say, but I personally didn't feel like I had a lot to say. And I think, you know, fast forward to now, I feel like there are less people listening to what I have to say, but I feel like I finally found my voice. And I feel like I have more to say. So just because the singing is going to be set aside to be mindful of the art form, I will always have something to say. And so it's not like you can do a 30-day, you know, um, hey, I'm going to retire in 30 <laughs> days and give a notice. And so you kind of have to think about what it's going to look like two years from now when, you, when we've gone to all the cities that we want to go to. And I do. I don't want to be like one of those athletes that you think well, they should have like retired like had Peyton Manning not <laughs> retired this year right <laughs> he and I were gonna have to have a conversation but yeah, all but, is well yes, that's right. you know and I you know I just I love music and the art of it so much that now I think I'm ready to just kind of help mentor the generation to come and so the tour was was very thoughtful in the sense that I didn't want to say goodbye and I didn't want to say farewell or finale because honestly it's for the fans and I don't like that word. I don't like the word fans or friends. So we kind of say friends um, <laughs> because um, they're who I've worked for. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who've come alongside and, you know, held us up and walked us through tough times and, spoken a word of encouragement here or there and so like at the end of the last supper when jesus washed the disciples feet and then he taught them what he had just done and then he taught them how to go and do it and then i love the scripture it says and he loved them well to the end and that is really the lens through which for me, this tour is, is to just love the people well who have loved us all these years. You talk about uh, loving your friends, <laughs> and I love what you what you said about 
um, this is who I've worked for all these years. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes uh, when in the context of Christian music or music <laughs> in the church, uh, there's a confusion sometimes about who bought that ticket. I don't remember God paying for those tickets. Mm -hmm. And I think it was you that you said one time, I think this was you or maybe I heard it somewhere else, but someone came up to you or someone else uh, after a show and said, oh, thank you for, for you know singing tonight for God or something. And there was a response that um, live my life. For God. Yeah. Actually, I, I think it was me and someone had come up, and this is once I had found my voice. Mm -hmm. What they said was, thank you so much for singing, but I wish you would sing it more for God. And <laughs> before I would have kind of let that comment go, mm -hmm. and I just kind of gently <laughs> tucked her back to me. Mm -hmm. And I said, you need to know that everything I do is for God. I live for him. I also want to be mindful of the people who are in the same space as we are. And if I can invite you to come alongside and turn your worship to God, then that is what I want to do. So don't misunderstand my eye contact with you mm -hmm. as not turning it to God. Mm -hmm. It's trying to be a leader in a worship setting so that that experience, all of us can turn our hearts and minds to God. I love that, you know, uh, the other night uh, when my parents and I came to the show and a lady asked a question about what you were gonna do in retirement. And I think that ties right into what you are looking to do. You're not uh, uh, teaching, which really was your first love and your first <laughs> career goal, right? It really was. I was one of those kids. I didn't play with dolls. I didn't play dress up. I played school. <laughs> and I, my parents got me a chalkboard and we put it on the inside of my door. <laughs> and I got empty Kleenex boxes and turned them upside down. And I had, those were my desks. There were rows and rows of desks. And so I got to choose anyone to be in my class. And so How real. John, Paul, George, and Ringo were in the front row. And uh, they all did well, by the way. Um, but I have always loved teaching so much. So I went to college to get my teacher certificate, studied voice and piano, you know, but was going to teach. And um, Bill and Gloria Gaither are alums of Anderson University and heard me sing and called and said, hey, we're looking for a backup singer to travel with us and let me pray about it, yes. So <laughs> um, my life really took a different direction then. And so one of the things I'm very much looking forward to is um, maybe expanding teaching. I'm starting mm -hmm. to teach now, doing mm -hmm. some online stuff with Mid-America Christian University. And I'm the artist in residence there, and um, we're doing a Christian Worship Arts and Leadership Certificate. And tell me some about that program yeah. and, and uh, how it's helping shape this culture of music leaders. Thank you. You know, yeah. um, we, I think worship, the word worship, which is a fabulous word, but it has kind of become very limited in the sense that when we say um, stand and worship, mm -hmm. we mean stand and sing, or this is a worship leader we kind of mean music and worship is so much bigger than just music music is part of worship mm -hmm. and so i started this this kind of started in me about three or four years ago i started doing kind of a biblical study of okay i'm a why person mm -hmm. and so why do we gather together why is corporate worship why is that important? Why? So I started to take a look at where that really began in the Old Testament and then the, the tabernacle and then in the temple. And worship is so much bigger than music. It's how we are every single moment of every day. Every breath we take is an offering to our Father. Mm -hmm. When we gather together in a worship setting, that's to experience our faith in community and it just makes it better for me i love community um so one of the things that we talk about in um this the class is what are your what are your jobs as a as a 
who person who leads music mm -hmm. in a worship setting. Mm -hmm. And I think so often we want to go right to the leading music. But I love that when they talk about who was responsible to build the tabernacle, if you were a woodworker, you were skilled and trained. If you were worked with iron or worked with the gold, mm -hmm. you were skilled and trained. No less with the musicians. Mm -hmm. The musicians were those chosen from a pool of ones who were skilled and trained. And I think we often overlook that piece of it, mm -hmm. that it is so important to be skilled and trained, skilled in your instrument, understanding music. What does it look like to be a leader to a group of people, to facilitate the opportunity for others to encounter mm -hmm. Christ? So I get really excited, <laughs> as you can yeah, tell, yeah. Um, just about helping empower those who are leading music in worship settings. Well, you talk about facilitating an opportunity for us to worship together. You know, I was thinking about this, so you're kind of reframing the definition of, of worship leader or worship music or what just worship means, again, outside the context of just music. But take it back to music and take it back to your concerts and your performances. You know, I think a lot of people would think of one of your shows because it's so uh, beautifully programmed and well executed and because the technique and the practice and the exercise of really honing the gift is there, think of it as a performance, but what's funny is just the other night I was listening and just eavesdropping to people around me in, in between the show and after the show. And what a consistent comment I kept overhearing was, we have been led into worship tonight. Mm. We have experienced worship tonight. Mm. And so what that says to me um, is that it does have room in the definition to, mm -hmm. to think about different contexts and excellence to be a key component in helping facilitate worship. Has that always been in throughout your career, when you think of concerts, when you're you know preparing a set list or your performance, has facilitating worship, mm -hmm. uh, has that always been a part of that thought process? You know, I think uh, later on in my career, I think I began to understand what that meant to facilitate worship. I think before then, I would have called it communication and relatability. Um, I would I watched my dad for years as a minister of music um, who would get congregations everywhere to just sing better than they ever thought they could. Hmm. I think he's <laughs> always taken a little bit of liberty with one verse, wherever two or three are gathered together, there I will make a choir because he, wherever it is, he just has this way of communicating, of encouraging mm -hmm. and uh, being relatable. And so I think I watched him connect with audiences, congregations, and really receive, get the best out of that audience. So I kind of, that was the lens I would look through first to be, to communicate, to be relatable. Then when I, I began to travel with Bill and Gloria Gaither, I was like, I was like just a master class. Mm -hmm. I'd just watch in my little backup girl chair. <laughs> and then afterwards I'd say to Bill, now why did you pick that song tonight but you didn't do it the other night? Mm -hmm. Now why did you skip this one? Hey, why didn't, and, and I know he must've just been <laughs> so annoyed. He never acted it, but I was always curious you know, how do you program? And it's all about connectedness, relatability. He, he, one of the things that he has always said that I've tried to um, really put into practice. One night, someone came up and put a, a note on his, uh, on his piano at intermission. And this is when they were in the round and mm. big production. And, and they said, why don't you sing The King is Coming like you used to sing it when I first heard it? You know, because they used to just go to churches mm -hmm. and it just used to be Bill on the piano. And so I asked Bill, I said, what do you do with that? And he said, here's, I know enough to know that if they heard it like they first heard it, they would not like it. <laughs> what they want to do is they want to feel like mm -hmm. they felt when they first heard it. To me, 
there have never been any wiser words spoken. Um, because you know, technology looks different than it did 30 years ago. Concerts mm -hmm. look different. Mm -hmm. Audiences are very wise. But what we want is to create an evening where they can feel what they felt. Mm -hmm that they were expecting to feel when they first heard a song. Mm -hmm. And expectations from audiences evolve through time and through... They're very savvy. Yeah, <laughs> more very, than ever, right? Very smart audience, but I'll tell you what they can do is they sniff authenticity mm -hmm. or uh, inauthenticity mm -hmm. very quickly. Mm -hmm. well, and they can be with you or they can not be with you. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's the relatability, right? That's mm -hmm. the component. You know, I think about that relatability so for me, uh, what my draw, you know, as a musician who loves Americana folk music, what my draw to your uh, message and your communication has always been your transparency. As someone who's worked his own personal recovery and, and gone through those steps, then it is relatability that can then um, color the rest of the performance to somehow feel personal. You know, I would say it's been the past 20, 25 years where your story has really begun to take root not only in your own life, but then uh, in your platform and in the message you communicate. How, what has that been like to be transparent on such a, pla a public platform? Um, did you have to make decisions in there somewhere? Okay, this is okay to share, you know, parts of your story and, and truth telling and, and growing in grace through all that. Uh, I'm interested in just how that journey of transparency uh, really took root yeah. in your life. I think for the probably the first 10 years of my career, I just tried to, and this was what was going on in my mind. I just wanna be an encouragement to people so I don't want to bother them with my stuff. <laughs> well, maybe I didn't even have stuff. <laughs> maybe my life was perfect and my husband was perfect and my kids were perfect and I was perfect and everything was perfect. Well, that's just, you know, the queen of denial right mm -hmm. there. <laughs> and I think when life kind of came crashing down, um, that was hard and yet I began to really understand what freedom looked like sometimes you know Jesus says you will know the truth and the truth will set you free in that context he was talking about his words but I also believe that is universal that if it's a truth about ourself and it is ugly but we speak it out loud Yep, I had an affair. Yep, I went through a divorce. Yes, my children were really hurt in the process. There's pain in that, but there's also a lot of freedom in that because the shame is what keeps you silent. Mm -hmm. the, the, the freedom can come when you speak it out loud. Now, there's consequences that still have to play themselves out and some consequences still continue to and i've had to learn forgiveness is not the same as consequences mm -hmm. god's forgiveness is there and it's just he is all in forgiveness with me but there are still consequences there are still questions that my kids have or there are still settings that um i know that someone needs to maybe process some of their own stuff. And so when I began to understand in my own life, the freedom that comes with telling my story, because I heard other people be brave and tell mm -hmm. their story. Mm -hmm. And I looked at them not, oh man, I'm never gonna listen to you again. It was like, oh, thank goodness I am not the only <laughs> one. It made me feel a lot braver. When I was invited to be part of the Women of Faith team, that's when not only the freedom but empowerment came for mm -hmm. me to share my story. Um, permission. Permission. Um, like no judgment in the sense of, well, you've got a story, sorry, you're not here. But in the sense of we invite you to tell your story 
and walk us past the, the hard times mm -hmm. into how God has been faithful and what are some steps you've done to heal those places, to reconcile what has restitution looked like mm -hmm. for you. Then I realize it has been an encouragement to other people. The letters that I used to get or just, I love your song, I love your music, thank you. The stories that mm -hmm. I hear now um, are mind-blowing. And what I say to them is, is then it's, now it's your opportunity mm -hmm. to be brave mm -hmm. so that somebody else can come along and hear your story and you can encourage and empower them. Mm -hmm. Well, Sandy, I mean, don't kid yourself. I mean, you think about how you telling your story has given so many people an opportunity to then tell their story or to just even own up to their story. Not all stories are meant to be told from right. a platform and not all stories are meant to be shared with even uh, your, your, your community at large. But people, what I've noticed, root for restoration. Yes. And they root uh, for um, healing and, uh, but, what your story allows us to do is identify our brokenness and not cover it up, which then, like you're saying, gives us the pathway. I and think freedom. one of the one of the most effective mechanisms that the enemy can use is to make us feel we are the only one. Mm -hmm. And when you feel like you're the only one, you're going to be quiet. And when we begin to share our stories with one another, um, there becomes such beauty in that brokenness mm -hmm. because we're we're not alone. Mm -hmm. Through because of your story, have there been songs of yours, and they could be songs that were from the first ten years, or uh, maybe later? Is there a song or a song or two that come to mind that you think have either become powerful? Uh, to sing now because of your story or have remained powerful or what does that bring to mind? This It's this right here. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eyes on the sparrow. And that's why I know he watches over me. That's my story.